welcome everyone to a talk about the Mandaeans. And I really feel honored that we have this number of people present for a talk about a subject which I'm guessing most of you are wondering what exactly is this going to be about. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I was tempted to ask for a show of hands. How many of you heard of the Mandaeans, apart from, from me? Right. But I imagine that if there were hands that went up, there would be few and far between. If I ask you how many of you have heard of Gnosticism, Gnostics, something like that, a lot more hands would go up, I'm pretty sure. Right? And so if we ask the question, who are the Mandaeans? And if we ask the question that I put on that first slide, why should you have heard of them already? Well, the answer is that most people have heard of Gnostics and Gnosticism. There were important finds of texts related to the Gnostics and this phenomenon of Gnosticism during the 20th century, made news headlines around the world, got scholars excited, got other people interested. And yet relatively few people have heard of the Mandaeans, who are effectively the last surviving Gnostic group from the ancient world. Right? So that's who they are. And clearly, if there is a Gnostic group that has survived from ancient times down to the present day, they ought to be getting a lot of attention. That's something that's really interesting. You may be aware that there have been recent startup Gnostic groups, uh, mostly localized in California from what I've seen on the internet. But otherwise, right, there's been an interest, a resurgence in Gnosticism. Why have so few people heard of the Mandaeans? Why isn't there more being done about them? The Mandaeans have been known by and continue to be known by a number of names. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Sabians, um, mentioned in the Quran. Uh, Nazareans is another term that is used sometimes either for the Mandaeans as a whole or for uh, those particularly adept in spiritual matters. And during the colonial era, the Mandaeans came to be known as St. John Christians and mistakenly known as St. John Christians. Uh, during the colonial era, European powers came into contact with groups like the Thomas Christians of India. And so when they found this group, in Mesopotamia, which seemed to have some common traditions with Christians. They called them St. John Christians, but eventually they realized, ooh, uh, I don't think these people are Christians at all. <laughs> and we'll say more about that. Right? Historically, they've been found in the border region where Iraq and Iran meet, right? so uh, uh, localized around rivers, uh, because baptism is one of the major rituals that is important to them. In fact, it's their central defining feature in a lot of ways. Iraq and Iran have not always been hospitable to them, and particularly in recent times, right, the Yazidis have gotten a lot of coverage because of the persecution that they've experienced, but the Mandaeans have experienced something very similar. And so there is a modern-day diaspora which has brought them to many parts of the United States, uh, the UK, Australia, Netherlands, Sweden, and many other places. They used to be known pretty much by those who traveled to Iraq and Iran to remote parts of those countries and to people who had interest for whatever reason in this obscure topic and read books about them. Right? Now they have a web presence and you can even see a Mandean baptism on YouTube. And so I decided to incorporate that into today's talk because you don't have to actually travel, much less travel far in order to see something like this. And so we'll get to that in a moment. But I related the Mandaeans to Gnosticism. And most of you have heard of Gnosticism. What is Gnosticism? And since there are colleagues present um, who are familiar with religious studies, as with most things, including the word religion itself, uh, the appropriateness of the word, what exactly it means, if anything, um, is debated by scholars. I'm going to make a nod to that and then set that aside and we're going to talk about Gnosticism because <laughs> there seems to be a real thing which, whether that's the best term for it or not, is a genuine religious phenomenon. Right? And so here are some of the things that are found in Mandaism, are found in the Nag Hammadi texts that were found in Egypt and seem to be characteristic of most if not all of the groups to which that label, rightly or wrongly, could be applied. Right? One of them, and perhaps the most interesting is that the creator of the material world, right, and the material world is viewed negatively, right, it's this place of aches and pains, of um, organic chemistry exams, of, <laughs> of grading, of all kinds of suffering and mishaps, and, and so 
the material world is viewed negatively, and that was a common uh, viewpoint in the ancient world. For Gnostics, the creator of the material world is also a malevolent figure, because who else would make the kind of world we live in with all these aches and pains, except a figure who wasn't very nice and at best was a bungler and not very adept at <laughs> creation, right? And in some text, that figure, that creator, is explicitly identified with the creator in Genesis. And so there's some interesting things to talk about there. Right? There is also a supreme, indescribable, transcendent God who is viewed as above, beyond, and far removed from that creator. And a series of emanations, if you want to call them, that coming forth from that one unknowable supreme being and eventually getting us to uh, the creator through a process that places that creator at far removed from that perfect God, uh, separate the two. Right? And so in some ways, Gnosticism really is an attempt to solve the problem of evil. Right? How can there be a supreme good God and a place where people are not entirely happy? And it sticks a lot of stuff in between the supreme God and the creator of the world in order to accomplish that. Whether that's an effective and convincing solution to the problem of evil is another question, but you can understand why someone would come up with this way of thinking. Right? And another typical characteristic of Gnosticism is that humans, sometimes it's some humans, sometimes it's in principle all humans, but humans have a spark within us, a connection with the light world, right? that supreme realm where the transcendent God dwells, and whether through knowledge, whether through rituals, whether through some combination of the two, can prepare to ascend there when they die. And so these are some char characteristic features of Gnosticism as we find it in general. Right? So what's distinctive of the Mandeans among Gnostics? Well, first and foremost, and I think it deserves top billing, they still exist as a living tradition. Right? We found these fascinating texts in Egypt, right? the Nag Hammadi texts. Uh, you may know them under the heading of the Gnostic Gospels. And scholars have had all sorts of questions about those. What did they mean by this? Uh, there's a reference to seals and other kinds of rituals. What did they do? How did that work? And while there may be a history of development, which means that we can't simply assume that what Mandeans do today is exactly what ancient Mandeans did, there's still a living tradition, right? And that gives us the possibility of looking at these texts in connection with the living tradition in a way that we can't with other Gnostic texts. Mandaic, the language in which these are, texts are written, is a dialect of Aramaic, right? And there have been finds of Gnostic literature in Greek, in Coptic, in other languages. There are some Manichaean texts in um, another dialect of Aramaic, but for the most part, we don't have Gnostic literature in this particular language family, and so that makes them interesting as well. And then there are connections to the biblical tradition which make the Mandeans particularly interesting. The Demiurge, right, that inferior creator, not entirely positive, and really for the Mandeans, negative figure, malevolent figure, is called Adonai, which is essentially the Hebrew term for Lord, which is used for God in the Hebrew Bible. Right? Closely associated with Adonai is Ruha de Kudashah, right, the Holy Spirit. And these are negative figures in Mandeism, whereas they're po positive figures in the Bible. Right? John the Baptist gets an important mention. And in fact, the book that I've been working on, the Mandaean text that I've been working on translating in recent years, um, is associated with John the Baptist and is often known as the Book of John or the Teaching of John. And John the Baptist is viewed by Mandaeans not as their founder, but as an important instance of a Mandaean, a famous Mandaean. And that's interesting, right? Because we hear the name John the Baptist, and most of us know that doesn't mean that he was like Southern Baptist or something like that, right? But does that mean John had this distinctive ritual and that was unique to him and that's why he was known that? Or does that mean that John was in a category of baptizers of whom there were others in that time period, right? And so in dialogue with the Mandaean literature and tradition, there are interesting questions that we might ask about John the Baptist. They like John the Baptist, they don't like Jesus, at least in their texts. Right? They have a negative view of Jesus, they view him as an apostate Mandean, and I'll say more about that as I summarize for you uh, one of the stories that they have a version of which is also found in the New Testament. Baptism is their main ritual, but this is not the one-off act of conversion 
or of initiation that you get in Christianity. It's a repeated act to achieve forgiveness and to prepare for ascent to the light world. Water is viewed as coming down from the heavenly realm, and so this was a natural way to express the desire to, um, or to actually physically, tangibly connect with the light world. And some of the terminology that's used in the Mandaean tradition is interesting. When they talk about flowing water, right, baptism is not to take place in stagnant water, at least traditionally. The Aramaic phrase is living water, which, of course, is familiar to readers of the Bible. And that sort of water appropriate for baptism is referred to as a Jordan by the Mandaeans. And so the question of who are these people, where do they get these things from, and do they have any historic connection with Judaism, with Christianity, with the Bible? How do you end up with this belief system? All of those, I think, are very interesting questions. And we're going to spend at least some time looking at some of them today. Right? So Mandean baptism. Right? The term Sabians, right, Sabi'un in uh, Arabic, is the name by which the Mandeans are mentioned in the Quran. And it basically means baptizers. Right? And so this is what they're known for. As I said earlier, in the past, one had to travel to remote parts of Iraq or Iran to see their ritual. Um, occasionally happened in Boston at a conference, uh, but it you know, was largely not visible to people, even if they were interested. Nowadays, on YouTube, and so without further ado, let's give you one of several YouTube videos that depicts a Mandaean baptism. So this is one of the reasons why, as a professor, I don't complain about the internet. Right? Yeah. Uh, students can find all kinds of weird stuff that's just not really particularly useful. But there is some great stuff, and there are some great advantages to living in the internet age. Um, just briefly about the symbolism of Mandian baptism. Right? Water is just thought to descend from above, from the light world. And that's very ancient symbol, right? The idea of uh, a divine heaven uh, fertilizing the earth to bring forth seed is very ancient symbolism, right? Uh, the myrtle branch, which you may have noticed uh, being inserted under the person's um, uh, cloak there, right, uh, along their forehead, right, also symbolizes life and fertility, often is used uh, essentially as a protection against you know, evil forces and things of that sort. And so the symbolism of baptism is, again, something that we can study in a way that we can't some other ancient rituals, because here we can ask Mandaean priests, what does this mean to you? And of course, sometimes priests make things up in order to <laughs> keep people happy. Uh, but we do actually have some texts that talk about the symbolism. And whether those explain the original reason for doing some of these things is something scholars will always debate. But at the very least, we have sources of information, um, which makes it very interesting. Right. Let me talk about the texts as well, because I'm a textual scholar first and foremost. Right? Most of what I've done in relation to the Mandaeans has been work on translating and subsequently working on commenting on and explaining uh, one of their texts, which had not been translated into English in its entirety previously. Right? So Mandaic is a dialect of Aramaic. Right? You can see the script there. Uh, one thing that's interesting about this dialect of Aramaic is that it's written with vowels. Right? So um, Semitic languages usually are not and had vowels added later, but this is a script that includes v symbols for vowels. Another thing that's interesting about this script, this alphabet, is that there's no known secular usage of it. Right? So we find it in what are known as magical bowls. I'll show you some examples of those in amulets and in Mandaean scripture and sacred texts. And that raises some interesting questions about the Mandaeans. Right? 
is this a separate community and linguistic group, or were they part of another community of Aramaic speakers, perhaps you know, a Jewish community in Mesopotamia, which also had a special script that they used for magical and religious purposes. Okay. So their alphabet and their uh, language is interesting for a number of reasons. Okay. Magic bowls are very cool, and there's not a lot else that I can say from a scholarly perspective about them. We find them, <laughs> and sometimes they have incantations on them, so we know that they're used for magical purposes, but we don't have a lot of detail about how they were used. Right? I mean, did you put two of them together and try and you know, keep the demon in there, and then that gives you, you know, protection from them? Um, but what we find is that these things exist. And one of those, right, the one that's on your left, right, is a Mandaic magical bowl. This one is written in the square script that many of you will know from Hebrew, but was first and foremost the Aramaic alphabet. And so we find both, and sometimes we find both within the same community. So again, that raises the question of, who are these people and how do they relate to other Aramaic speakers in that part of the world? Mandaean literature. Their most important sacred text is known as the Great Tringer, the Treasure, Ginza Rabah. It's never been translated into English in its entirety. The Book or Teaching of John, another one which now I can say has been translated into English in its entirety. Right? We got an NEH grant and we're working on that. Uh, not all of it is uploaded onto our site yet, so you can't read all of it. Uh, but parts of it are there. Right? And so Google us and you can find that. Uh, there are texts which had been translated previously. Uh, the Canonical Prayer Book, uh, the Haran Goetha, which is a very small, obscure, difficult text, but which has references to Mesopotamian kings and things of that sort, which give us snippets of what may actually be historical reminiscences of this people, and thus clues to their movements and their origins. There are a variety of esoteric commentaries on their rituals, explaining them for priests, things of that sort. And among these manuscripts, some of them are illustrated. And I'll start you off just to give you a, a glimpse of that. Here's an actual facsimile of a Mandaean illustrated manuscript that a scholar who works on their art brought to a conference that I attended in Oxford. And while I'll have some pictures that will do slightly better justice, uh, not much better justice, but at least slightly better justice to some of their art, I wanted to include this picture because it gives you a sense of the context, right? That you have these illustrations within, literally within, the sacred text itself. Right? And so there are depictions of the earth and trees, of the light world, uh, particularly trees and types of plants that were important to the Mandaeans for symbolic reasons. There are depictions of light world figures, right? Abathur, who was sort of the great judge, the guardian of the uh, purgatories, right, who would weigh people's uh, deeds in the scales, other figures. And one thing that I think you will uh, immediately notice looking at these examples of illustrations in Mandaean manuscripts is that there's a very distinctive kind of art here. And there's, again, a scholar uh, who attended that conference and who brought that facsimile of the scroll talking about uh, some of the details of the art from the perspective of art history. Right? There's a distinctive artistic style in these scrolls, which is very interesting as well. And we could easily have spent a long time just talking about the scrolls themselves if we wanted to. The scrolls have, for the most part, at the end of them, something which also is very interesting for scholars looking at them. Copying a sacred text is a religiously meritorious act in Mandaism. And so what that means is that you want to get credit for your religiously meritorious acts, right? And so scribes would add their names to the list of scribes who'd copied the texts before them. And so Joran Buckley, who's probably the only scholar in the world who works almost exclusively on Mandaism, has written a book called Great Stem of Souls, which tries to trace those lineages, noticing historical references among them, uh, comparing manuscripts to get a sense of when, you know, how much when these people lived and how much time passed between various scribes. And she tries to make the case that you can actually trace some of the oldest texts of the Mandians back to at least the third century, which of course is when we know there was a uh, a revival of if or. Um, uh, a widespread popularity of Gnosticism 
what's their relationship to Judaism and Christianity? Right? And this is a question that particularly interests me. And I put that slide up there because this is an example of the Mandeans adopting to life in a different place. And so they don't have access to a river and don't make the temporary cult hut that they normally would. Uh, but a lot of things here you know, could be a Baptist church. right? Um, and so I want to talk about their relationship to Judaism and Christianity. And just before I started the talk, somebody asked me, yeah, so how did you get interested in this? And those of you who know me know that I have a very short attention span, and so it's not hard to imagine me getting interested in just about anything. My background is in biblical studies and primarily New Testament and early Christianity. And my doctoral work was actually on the Gospel of John. And if you work primarily on the Gospel of John, you will hear about the Mandeans sooner or later. Because in the middle of the 20th century, particularly in German language uh, New Testament scholarship, it was a widely held view, or at least the case was made by a number of scholars, that the Mandeans might be the descendants of followers of John the Baptist, and that these texts might actually be the background to the Gospel of John. Problems were pointed out with that view, and most New Testament scholars lost interest in the Mandeans. While there certainly were problems with those views, some of the reasons that were given for dismissing uh, those earlier views are themselves problematic and don't reflect detailed knowledge of these texts. And so these are subjects that need to be revisited. But the question of how I ended up working on this, it wasn't just working on the Gospel of John. I didn't say, ooh, Mandeans, let me do that. But <laughs> came to Butler and taught change in tradition, which eventually became global and historical studies right, in, a, in a later life. And saw the reference to the uh, Sabians, right, as people of the book, and wondered, well, who are they, right? Because hadn't put two and two together at that stage. And then developed a course, which I'm teaching this semester on, I call it heresy, because something like extra-canonical early Christian literature, far fewer students would have signed up for that. <laughs> right? But we look at the Mandaean text in that. And as I was looking for primary source material for that course, came across excerpts of the Mandaean text again. And it renewed my interest, and it reminded me of connections that have been made previously. And then I realized, wow, these people are still around. And I said, well, let me read more, and discovered that some things that I wanted to read more of simply weren't available in English. And so I decided to start dabbling, and lo and behold, there was a conference I could go to in Oxford, and so I decided to propose a paper. And what I discovered is that you wouldn't need a room this size to gather all the people in the world who do anything related to the Mandians whether as ancient texts, as modern religion, uh, their uh, humanitarian crisis in the present day, any and all aspects, people came. A number of Mandeans from the UK also attended that conference. And the conference room was smaller than the one we're in now. And there were a few people missing, but most of the people in the world who work on this were there. And easily a dozen or more topics were mentioned during that conference about which all that could be said was, it would be great if somebody worked on this. Because we really need answers, but nobody's done it yet. That's very different from my own field of New Testament. Right? Oh. It's crowded. Right? <laughs> Trying to come up with something new to say about the New Testament is a struggle. And so this is a field where I was like, you want to come and do some dabble? You would be very welcome. And so um, that kind of welcome can, um, can keep you interested. If we look at their texts, as well as some details of their rituals, on the one hand, I've already mentioned that there are some what we might call anti-Jewish and anti-Christian elements, and that's common in religious polemic and texts, right? Uh, there are anti-Jewish and anti-Christian elements in Jewish and Christian texts as well, if you're familiar with that, right? But there are also similarities to both. And you'll notice here, for instance, the, the banner that's used, right? And the focus is on the banner. The banner is what's important, but it's draped across essentially a cross beam. Yeah. And so that imagery looks kind of Christian. Right? And the one on the, that's on your left there definitely shows Christian influence because you know, we usually depict, you know, often depict the Holy Spirit above Jesus, the cross, something like that in the Christian tradition. The Holy Spirit's not a positive figure in Mandaism, right? And so here they're actually adapting and borrowing in interesting ways. Right? There are similarities, there are differences. One thing that I recently um, focused on in uh, some work I was doing is that there are frequent mentions of Jerusalem in the Mandaean literature. 
there are more mentions, essentially, per page, if we want to find a way of calculating, than there are, for instance, in the Babylonian Talmud, right, which is a Jewish text, which you'd expect to mention Jerusalem, and it does, but not as frequently as the Mandaean texts do, which come from Mesopotamia as well. And so, why do they mention Jerusalem? And what's more, why do they blame the destruction of Jerusalem on Jewish authorities having persecuted Mandaeans? That doesn't seem to me to be something that's likely to have been invented after the destruction of Jerusalem. And so, does this give us a connection, does this detail in these texts give us a connection with the same context that gave rise to what we know of today as Judaism and Christianity, right, in its modern form? Right? Terminology that they use. Sunday is their sacred day. I thought, in order to give at least a snippet of the Mandaean tradition and what it has to say about this kind of subject, we could just have a brief introduction, a brief survey of what the Mandaean version of Jesus' baptism by John, because they have a story about that too, says in the Mandaean book of John. And you can actually read my translation of it online. Right? Um, this is what our web page looks like. You probably know this story, and for the sake of time, I won't summarize it, uh, but you probably know some version of the Christian story. At the very least, you know, Jesus goes to John the Baptist, and he's baptized, and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And I have to mention, even though it's not directly relevant, that when I went to Israel um, this past summer, went for the first time to the place along the Jordan River, which is traditionally the um, location where Jesus was baptized by John, and unfortunately, the student didn't catch the picture while the dove was overhead. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been a great picture, right? Yeah. Um, but there was a dove. At the co and that got me wondering, I mean, how often do doves actually fly overhead? And what does that you know, have to do with any of this? But uh, I had to mention this. So there we go. So the story of John baptizing Jesus in the Mandean version right, has some elements which are familiar, but also different. Right? John refuses. And in... The Gospel of Matthew, for instance, we have John saying, you know, I need to be baptized by you. Yeah. There's a refusal in the Mandean version as well, but it's not because he views Jesus as superior, but because he distrusts him. Right? We have the Holy Spirit present, but not as a positive figure. Right? And when Jesus goes to John asking to be baptized, he essentially asks him to make him his disciple. And for those who've done work in the New Testament, that's very interesting because... One question that historians have often asked is, was the historical figure of Jesus, how, what was his relationship to John? Was it essentially that Jesus was part of John's movement, was one of John's disciples before doing his own thing? That kind of language is actually used in the Mandaean text. Right? And one thing which shows that this reflects knowledge of later texts, like the Gospels, right? it depicts Jesus as offering to mention John in what he writes, um, and of course, the gospel is not written by Jesus. But Jesus says, you know, I'll mention you in my texts if um, you baptize me. So, um, and there are a lot of things which are you know, essentially quite humorous and are also highly polemical. Right? And so a voice comes from heaven not saying, this is my beloved son. But it's like, don't worry, John. You can you know, go ahead and baptize the deceiver. Right? So um, where does this come from? Right? Clearly, some of the things that Mandaean texts say about uh, Jesus and about Christians reflect polemical interactions with Christianity in a later time. Right? There's concerns about uh, you know, crucifixes, there's concerns about you know, uh, monks and nuns and things of that sort which reflect you know, um, Christianity as it developed in later times. There are some things which seem like they're interacting directly with the New Testament. Right? This, reads, this story, which you can read online if you're interested, reads like a parody of the New Testament version. Right? There are other texts, for instance, the story of uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, John's parents, which seems like simply a different version. Right? It doesn't seem like you could get to that version if you were starting from the New Testament. Right? And so working out what's independent, what's dependent, how these texts relate to the New Testament, right? these are some of the important questions that we're trying to figure out. And they might be helpful to us in figuring out things about Mandaean origins, and maybe ultimately about Gnostic origins, right? The question of where Gnosticism comes from, how it comes about, is a question that scholars ponder and continue to argue about. Right? And so if some of the things that are mentioned in these texts can connect the Mandaeans with a period prior to the destruction of the Herodian Temple in Jerusalem in the year 70, 
that would take us back very early and potentially um, shed some light on that question. But we're running out of time. Right? I will mention quickly that we're making progress in academic study. Right? There have been translations, commentaries are the things that I've been working on, things that others have been working on. We've actually got the start of a Society for Mendian Studies. But there's a lot to be done. Um, if you work in a field that's any way related to this, even tangentially, you'd be welcome to contribute something, I'm quite sure. I've shown pictures of Mandeans engaged in ritual acts because their religious tradition is what I focus on and what I thought would be most interesting to you. But Mandeans do not dress this way except when they're engaging in their ritual. And so you may have met a Mandian and may not know it, right? Uh, if you met somebody from that part of the world, right? The estimates that I've heard that seem most reliable put their numbers in the tens of thousands, um, not more than that. Um, but it's very hard to trace because it's uh, hard to get accurate estimates of their numbers in their historic homeland, and many have been fleeing there, and keeping track of them is also difficult. The tradition seems at one point to have accepted converts. They have stories of that, but they don't today. And that may have been an adaptation to living in the predominantly Islamic world where converting from Islam uh, could get you into serious trouble. And so as a religious minority, you're better off not accepting converts. But that puts their tradition in danger of being lost. Uh, if you marry someone who's not a Mandean, essentially the tradition ends with you. Right? Your spouse can't convert. Your children are um, you know, sort of half and half, as it were. And so. The question of how this tradition will survive, if at all, in the present day is one that the Mandaeans are worried about. And so as a scholar working on this, my hope is that in translating these texts into English, right, we can help preserve something that's an important culture, an important religious tradition, something that's important to us to know about. But we may also, in the process, help the Mandaeans themselves preserve their tradition and pass it on to children who don't speak either Mandaic, one of the modern spoken dialects, or Arabic, or any other language in which they might have had these writings. Right? And so those are the most important things I wanted to say about the Mandeans. They're a very distinctive culture, one that's survived for thousands of years. Uh, they're fascinating to me as a scholar of early Christianity, but they're interesting in their own right. Um, and they should be of interest even if you're not interested in ancient religion, even if you're not interested in um, strange magic bowls and what you might do or might not do with them, but interested in humanitarian crises that people are facing in the present day. So the Mandeans, the first Baptists, right, ancient uh, baptizing group, the last Gnostics who survived down to the present day. Uh, that's all I have to say on the subject uh, for now, but we can open it to questions if there are any. Thank you. I have a really quick question about the, the ritual that you showed. Yeah. Is the clapping part of it? I haven't always heard clapping at them. So I, I think, um, I'm pretty sure there was something that was going on sort of on the shore okay. uh, line. Okay. So I, I have not consistently heard clapping as part of that. Um, yeah. Um, I did, yeah. And I don't know, I, yeah. Uh, I have snippets of Arabic. Uh, I had enough to work out that uh, there's a video of a Mandean baptism taking place in Sweden on YouTube. And I was able to, I definitely heard the word cold uh, there. Uh, but I didn't, yeah, I often don't make out everything that's being said. But uh, they have, they have, they, they do have one. Um, it's interesting, again, I heard uh, there's a video of uh, Mandeans who've adapted to uh, life in Australia and their community and singing songs which sound like they're very much in a Western style, uh, which is interesting. Uh, I'm not sure that anything has been done uh, musicologically on, you know, say, their, their folk tradition or ancient traditions. Uh, yeah, uh, Bartok didn't make it that far, um, I don't think, but that would, that would be fascinating. Um, and if you can put me in touch with someone, I mean, I have enough musical interest as well as interest in the Mandeans that I'd, I'd be interested in trying to get somebody interested in exploring that. Um, but it's a great question. Yeah, and same uh, with the, the baptism. You said that the, um, the, the Holy Spirit is a, is a negative? Yeah. Okay, yeah. is the Holy Spirit still associated with a dove? And how is, does that work when they're being baptized? I mean, like, how does the whole thing about the, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit being present? What did they do trying to get rid of all the doves? I mean, you know, right. in the area. Yeah, is, no. How, um, does it, how does it play out? Right. The idea of the Holy Spirit being there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the story about Jesus being baptized. Uh -huh. uh, but she's basically there to 
cause trouble. And one of the interesting things is that you have this word, which is the same word that means holy in you know, Aramaic and in Hebrew, right? It's a, it's a related term. But because this is a negative figure, I mean, does that word mean what we mean by holy? Or is this like, you know, infernal? Is this something else? You know, does this have a different connotation? And so in that story, there's a place where she says that you know, through this baptism, you have, you know, we could translate sanctified me and my children. But is that, is that something positive or is that something negative? You know, what's happened as a result of that, right? Uh, the, the, the spirit is viewed as the, um, essentially the consort of Adonai, um, which is interesting, and as the mother of the seven planets, which are viewed as these malevolent celestial forces. Uh, but yeah, the dove is not normally associated with Mandaean baptism, and the Holy Spirit is not there, except to the extent that by connecting with the light world, you're... Um, trying to escape from under her influence and from the influence of these malevolent celestial forces. Uh, and so that's why I noted that bit of what looked more like Christian than Mandaean imagery there in that um, instance. Thanks. Let's see, other questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I have one more. I have sure. class. Yeah. So um, you mentioned that, it's, it, that people who marry outside of the religion, that they're, they can't have converts and their children are sort of half and half mm-hmm. and they're sort of in this this not not quite uh, uh, mm-hmm. the same. Is it? I mean, I'm thinking of like Judaism. When someone who's Jewish marries somebody who's not Jewish, as long as your mother's Jewish, mm-hmm. you're Jewish. Okay. So I was wondering, is there is there any of that? Like, if, if, if one of the two, if the you know the spouse is either male or female, if the child then is automatically Mandaean. There isn't a tradition of that. Um, the Mandaeans are talking about this uh, a lot yeah. because they're aware that um, their tradition is in um, you know in in peril of being lost. And so, at the very least, allowing <coughs> children of marriages outside of the faith to be raised in the faith and then considered to be continuing that tradition uh, is something that has been proposed. But it's essentially adaptation of a tradition to a situation that's different. And so, um, emphasizing marrying within your faith was a good survival mechanism when you had a particular geographic location that you were located in and things like that, it doesn't work so uh, well when you're adapting to someplace else. Right? Okay, but it's not, it's so, not tied to the maternal or the paternal it's not. Um, it's traditionally that if you're of Mandaean parentage, then you're certainly born into the tradition. Yeah. So they don't have a ready-made answer to that the way yeah. Judaism does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just in, uh, a little bit, um, when I saw your talk, I looked it up a little bit. There was something about that the Mandaeans for a long time, at least in the Middle East, got a, I don't know, got a pass. They were considered to be, or I read, that they were considered to be people, I forgot the term, sort of people of the Bible, so therefore they could exist in the Arabic country. They were old people of the old religion. Um, they were mentioned that they had some legitimacy. But apparently that has now been removed, that, that stamp of approval or whatever has now been removed. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's kind of come and gone in a sense. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that story. So there's a phrase um, which is actually people of the book, uh, Kotab, which covers Jews, Christians. So groups that were viewed as um, essentially monotheists in the same tradition as Islam and thus is having and existing prior to Islam and having some legitimacy, right? Islam recognized uh, the legitimacy of other prophets, provided that they talked about the one God and so on and so forth. (coughs) And the view is that the Mandaeans probably codified many of their texts uh, in that period in response to the arrival of Islam in order to make clear that we have have a book. Uh, And so some of these texts seem to reflect editing in that period, but there are Mandaean texts which... uh, altogether lack uh, Arabic loanwords and things like that, which is unusual in Aramaic literature that is written after the um, arrival of Arabic in that region and use of Arabic as a dominant language. And so it seems clear that their traditions go back before the arrival of Islam. They seem to have gotten approval as people of the book under that name of Sabians, but there's another group that's known as the Haranian Sabians, uh, who basically uh, worshipped astral deities and clearly were polytheists and had a similar name for themselves. And whether they adopted that name in order to try and get uh, approval in an Islamic context, but they, they really muddied the waters in terms of what is a legitimate Sabian and who, are, who is the Quran talking about and those kinds of questions. And so as a result, 
the question of whether the Mandeans have this status and are protected people and should be left unmolested, or whether they don't have that status, uh, is something that uh, legal experts within the Islamic tradition have debated. And we actually find the Mandeans mentioned and their uh, status discussed in Islamic literature down the ages. Yeah. Do we have time for more questions? Yeah, go ahead. Do they have priests or pastoral? Priests. Or yeah, priests is the term. Yeah. Um, I mean, their main their main role is you know, the performing of baptisms, but they are also you know, very much viewed as spiritual leaders. Uh, it's interesting that the term uh, which has come to mean priest is is uh, derives from the Aramaic word that means disciple, um, uh, tarmid, and so uh, it's an interesting question. You know, when Jesus goes to John and says, "Let me become your disciple," on the one hand, that term in later times means initiate me into the priesthood. But in the context of that story, it doesn't seem like it's talking about that. And so um, it seems like it may actually reflect the earlier meaning of that as a disciple. Uh, but essentially, you know, the priest's r role uh, is as religious experts. Um, as with a lot of Gnostic traditions, there were mystical aspects of the tradition which you don't tell just anyone, right? And so a lot of Mandeans would say, you know, we understand that baptism you know, helps us achieve forgiveness, connect, you know, for, helps us um, achieve purification from sins and things of that sort. But if you ask them about the details, uh, a lot of them haven't read their texts, haven't, you know, don't know a lot of the details even about, well, why do we do this in the, um, the baptismal ritual? And so the priests, more than anything else, uh, have historically been the sort of the guardians of the texts and of the traditions um, of the rituals and their correct practice, but also their interpretation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more. You talked about sort of in the in the writings about concerns about monks and stuff, and mm -hmm. sort of the how the Nakamadi texts were found essentially next to the most important <coughs> the sort of mm -hmm. monasteries of late antiquity. Yeah. I wonder if these right. writings could help us understand that a little. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. And what they say about, you know, they're, they blame Jesus for nuns and monks, and basically their complaint is that, you know, this, this practice of celibacy, this, you know, cutting off of, you know, childbearing is in fact, you know, something that they, they view negatively, right? So, and that's something that's interesting about the Mandeans among Gnostics, right? Some Gnostics took a very, very negative view of sexuality, of marriage, of childbearing, and things of that sort. Uh, the Mandeans don't view it in that way. Um, and that is another one of their distinctive features. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and figuring out how they ended up with the distinctive view that they had is you know, a historical puzzle that um, I honestly couldn't give you a, a definitive answer to at this stage. Uh, I'm not sure whether anyone will ever be able to, but, um, yeah. but it's, a, it's a very good question. <laughs> yeah. Do they have connection to other Gnostic groups? I mean, if we're looking at other Gnostic movements and, mm -hmm. and other places, we find mentions of them, or is they sort of a self-contained, as far as we know? Uh, there is something in uh, Manichaean literature, right? Uh, the Manichaeans um, are, um, a no I guess you could call them a Gnostic group um, in late antiquity, but a very distinctive one with you know, some very, very um, unusual beliefs. They're not found in any other Gnostic group. Uh, but they clearly knew of the Mandeans. Uh, we have them borrowing Mandean um, tradition. And so there are some things that are known as the, um, mm -hmm. what are they called? The Coptic Psalms of Thomas, which are uh, Manichaean Psalms. And among them, there are some which are clearly borrowed from the Mandeans. And so if those could be d um, associated definitively with Thomas, who is a disciple of Mani, then we would have a very clear date you know, anchoring them to before that time. Uh, but there have been debates, as always, about you know, is that text actually connected with that Thomas or with someone else and things of that sort. Uh, but they, mentioned, they, meant they use Mandian text. Uh, we have Christians in Mesopotamia mentioning them, although that's much later, um, I think around 7th or 8th century. Uh, but the question of whether we have them mentioned at any earlier time is an interesting one. One of the terms that they use, Nazarean, is very interesting. And there's a word that looks more like that Mandean term that's found in the New Testament uh, and looks more like that Mandean term that looks like a way of saying somebody from Nazareth. Right? Um, Paul, for instance, in Acts is called a ringleader of the Nazareans. Right? 
And so was that a term that already existed in New Testament times? I mean, were the Christians, when they used that spelling, saying, okay, they're putting this label on us, but let's connect it with Nazareth and do some damage control here? Or what, what is the history of that? You know, and those are questions which it's, again, hard to answer definitively. Uh, the further back we go, the less clear the references are and less clear the connections are. Uh, but there certainly are some, and they're intriguing. And there are also similarities to, say, the Nag Hammadi um, texts, right, which suggest that, you know, make clear that there's a shared tradition, um, even if we can't pin it down very precisely. And we connect that to the Nazarite vows and practices, that saw all those unshaven guys, and so I just wonder. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that seems to be, I mean, linguistically, that seems to be a different spelling, a different, different term. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, they, they converge and they get confused in you know, Christian literature. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so are there any in this uh, <coughs> I was contacted by one who then moved away, so um, yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, real local presence. Um, yeah, there's certainly there are certainly Mandaeans in other um, hubs uh, in uh, places like San Diego. Um, one of the reasons why I brought my uh, family with me to um, the recent uh, Society of Biblical Literature conference in San Diego was that there's a Mandaean there who is actually an example of what I was talking about. Uh, he married outside the faith, uh, but he also did something which uh, Marguerite and I also did, which is marry a Romanian, and so uh, wanted to introduce him and his wife to me and my Romanian wife and make some connections. Uh, but they're one of these cases that the Mandaean community is trying to figure out how to deal with. Uh, I'm not aware of any significant Mandaean presence um, here. And the one person who got in touch with me who was here uh, was sort of passing through and had not found other Mandaeans to connect with here. So. Uh, but most, most of the big hubs, you know, New York, Boston, San Diego, um, there's Often a presence. Yeah, you had a oh, I just sort of a trivial follow, follow up to that. In your list of where they had immigrated to, most of them I could understand in terms of economics and geography, but how did Sweden pop into, into this? I, I don't actually know the story behind that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, know, not, yeah. Of, I was just in Sweden last summer and I saw some astonishing groups of people in downtown Stockholm mm -hmm. kind of sharing their faith practices and the, the Swedish people mostly walked around and ignored it. Some of them sort of sneered at it, um, but there seems to be an influx of little niche groups trying to find some place to live. I can understand England mm -hmm. or whatever because that's a tradition already they have to go into France or whatever. Mm -hmm. Sweden seems just climate wise a little bit. Mm -hmm. sort of yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even even England and Scotland are, <laughs> you know, stretching <laughs> stretching the boundaries of the comfortable. Uh, I wonder whether Sweden has uh, some uh, favorable uh, laws regarding asylum uh, that might uh, be part of it. I seem to recall something along those lines, but I'm not I'm not entirely sure. Sorry. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for thank you for being here.